What is up, you savages? This is the Protect Your Neck Podcast, and I'm your host, Dan Tom. Analyst is work you'd find over at MMA Junkie as well as OutsTrekkerUS.com. But on this here program, the Protect Your Neck Podcast, we break down high-level MMA. That's what we're going to do here today, tonight. Whenever you're listening to this, hopefully it's for the fight. Uh, I'm recording this uh, in the wee hours of the morning uh, for Las Vegas time, Pacific time for UFC Vegas 49. Uh, UFC Fight Night 202, UFC Fight Night Mahachev versus Green. Um, we'll be breaking that down from top to bottom. Check the timestamps for when it starts, as per usual. And as per usual, um, I'll recap my picks and plays at the very end of the episode. Uh, I, I don't want to jinx it. Well, I'm going to try to expedite this one as much as I can. I know I've been going you know, over the hour that I aim for lately, but, you know. Uh, we'll see. There's not a lot that I like, and we'll get to it because one of the very few bets I have this weekend is actually going on in Bellator, which is going on in in Ireland. I believe it's Ireland. Um, you know, could be right meow, depending on when you're listening to this. Uh, it's kicking off roughly about four hours uh, from when I'm recording this uh, on me, West Coast Pacific time specifically. So... Um, We'll get to what the fuck that is, that bet is. Oh, you fucking damn, huh? You tease the fucking bet you, you put on your Twitter. All right, don't, uh, sorry, I fucking come off the all, another all-nighter, so. Energy levels and impressions especially will be extra crappy. Um, a little out of practice with my, uh, gay, gay guard Musasi there. Gay guard Musasi is like, you gotta, like, you know, you gotta mix in, like, the, the, Dutch Netherlands accent of like an Alistair Overeem. It's like Alistair Overeem and Kermit the Frog had sex, and then you get to kind of make your way to Musasi from there, you know. Uh, you know, Overeem was like, "Well, basically, I'm going to uh, kick Brock and then diverticulitis, and we'll see what happens." But uh, then you had the fucking Kermit and the uh, fuck, you know. I did. I have pretty long one. You can get in line and suck it. That's it. I have to actually use an actual Musasi line. <laughs> Despite my comedy, that was an actual Musasi line. Shout out to my guy uh, Ben Kong from the Fight Site, man. Win number two uh, via the striking. Um, got his guy out of there early, and uh, of course he was a co-host here for Top Five Thick Fighters, which we ended up, you know, talking about thicks and and dicks <laughs> that episode. He as that's where the infamous Musasi for later hashtag came from. Um, go back and listen to that episode, or you can just kind of rewatch these weigh-ins or any Musasi weigh-ins to kind of get an idea where, pardon the pun, uh, <laughs> Ben's head was at. Um, my goodness, man. I mean, Musasi looks swole, Lynn, uh, at the weigh-ins, man. Do you guys see that? Jesus. Hey, underwear ads. Get at that guy. I mean, come on. All right. Wow, Dan, we are really starting this, uh. <laughs> We're really starting this in all. Is this the technical breakdown podcast? Because so far, that's all he talks about dicks. Don't worry, he talks about dicks for like 40, but he eventually gets to the fights. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Any new listeners, this is uh, sadly kind of the norm, but uh, no, I'm trying to be better. But yeah, it's been it's been crazy, but obviously I can't complain because it's uh, definitely first world problems this week with uh, everything going on in Ukraine. And um, I don't want to be the douchey thoughts and prayers, um, you know especially as Americans, we don't really have, um, unless, you know, those who proudly serve, obviously. Hats off to you. But uh, I'm talking about you know, the, the general Americans, like myself and, and many, we don't really have a perspective on, on what it's like to be in a, um, a war zone like that, right? Uh, not a lot of us do. Uh, anyway, so um, I can't imagine. I don't know if I have any listeners from Ukraine or listeners with family there. But um, as empty as it is, I apologize, but for what it's worth, um, I think it's really fucked up, you know, what's going on, and uh, I, I, my heart is sad, and it, it's kind of an insane week, you know, it's been insane for everybody for the year, yada, 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 TM, hashtag, um, but, um, you know, uh, it, just, just a lot going on, um, I, uh, my weekly thing, uh, this week was, uh, you know, I had small stuff to deal with, you know, my usual, which I just, is just funny at this point. It's, it's obviously first world problems. I can't, I don't even, 
I can't even really complain. Uh, it's just comical. That was the word I was looking for at this point. But uh, my laundry like went out for the, the umpteenth time, so I'm getting that fixed on like hopefully Monday. Um, rashing out the clothes right now. Um, dealing with family stuff and you know just trying to catch up with this week. All this, da, da, da. you know, same old same old stuff with me. And then it's like, you know, the stuff worldwide's happening. Trying to like tune out and focus. I'm still like. You know, I'm like, this stuff's, I don't even know, I'm not even, like, fully caught up with what's even going on with uh, my brothers and sisters up north in Canada. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, there was some, like, Asian hate in the Olympics and stuff that I was trying to catch up with. Like, there's all this stuff, and, uh, you know, it, it's hard. Uh, it's not that I don't care. Um, I just, man, I, I think that, that what I'm feeling is something I think we're all kind of feeling, right? I mean, uh, there's only so much time in the day, and... Uh, you know, there are really important perspective-shaking things, like what's going on in Ukraine, obviously, to kind of give you perspective and make, and hopefully makes us all kind of feel grateful if, you know, you're not living in a, in a you know, with bombs coming down on your head and whatnot, and a part of the world where that's going down. But, uh, but yeah, I just want to say that, um, I want to apologize for talking about it, but I want to apologize for if I haven't been talking or posting about things or this or that, no, I've been so damn busy. Uh, just trying to get my life, my family, my health, which is in the gutter, and and in this show to you guys as well, and, and my content, and my work done every week. Um, you know, it, it's it's been tough, but that doesn't mean I'm not thinking about anybody, and uh, wishing you all the best. So, just wanted to get that out there. Also, another crazy of, of uh, news to digest. Is shout out my guy John Morgan. You know, that's huge, man. I mean. John Morgan is like an MMA junkie, you know. Him, Dan, George and Goes are like the OGs, you know. Uh, George and Goes with Tag Radio. Dan starting up and, part, uh, you know, uh, recruiting John, if you will, and, and then starting the MMA junkie and all that. Uh, go to a Triple G show on Patreon or um, MMA Roadshow on Patreon, MMA Roadshow podcast, and MMA Junkie Radio podcast. Uh, those are free versions and Patreon extras that I just cited for both those. Um, but they go through uh, the history a lot, and I'm sure, especially on a week like this, they'll put it much better than my jacked up no sleep ass will. But I just wanted to bring that up because it's a it's a big fucking deal, and uh, b you know, um, I already said you know, uh, I had an exchange with John email and stuff, just saying nice things, but um. Just some of it, uh, just real quick, bears repeating here is just, uh, you know, and I appreciate the hell out of that guy, man. Uh, he's uh, listened to him on MMA Junkie Radio back in the day. Uh, called my amateur fight. Uh, as sad as a, a, a scene that was. Uh, you know, he, uh, I've known this guy for a while. And, um, you know, um, whether he's had me on his show or helped me behind the scenes, like I don't, I don't know, man. I'm a not an easy dude to to work with or be friends with. You know, is a, a theme I've learned. And uh, so when there's people who just you know still for whatever reason um, have helped me um, or you know been there in, in some shape or form, uh, you know I feel like I owe those people and appreciate the hell out of it. And John was one of those people for for me and many, by the way. You know. Um, Obviously a great guy to fucking have a beer with, and, you know, um, but, you know, hard pressed to find a, you know, anybody that has a bad word to say about him, uh, meeting them, you know, at shows or otherwise, uh, drinks, whatever, the occasion, um, so I, he will be in the space, I, I, I don't know, uh, what, I honestly don't, um, you know, didn't ask with the divulge in time anyway, so, I'm, you know me, I'm not a gossip person. I don't care to know if I did, I'm not one to, to tell and all that, so, um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll you know, uh, be curious what his next move is, I just wanted to give him a shout, man, um, he's been on this here podcast too, I believe, top five strike force fights, we did that in 2020, but, uh, yeah, man, shout out to John Morgan, the MMA Roadshow, um, all right, we're gonna do a, uh, 1027, quick recap, of UFC Fight Night 201, UFC Vegas 48, 
We went nine and three uh, overall in picks, one and zero in straight plays, four and one in props, zero and one in the parlay. Um, I put zero and two in the ads, but I'm actually one and two when you count the uh, the, uh, the the bomb or whatever you want to call it um, that I laid on Batista. I'm just thinking in bees because it was Batista, um, or I did the impulse play and I. Just, in, the, in a house where I couldn't play Bellator and some other stuff. Um, I just laid some Batista chalk that degenerate in me since, again, I didn't want to overexpose myself on parlays. Good thing, right? Because uh, it didn't come through the two-leg. Uh, I didn't want a combo stack. I would have been effed, at least with the combos that I chose, right? So that was a good move. And uh, laying the chalk, even though it's, I always feel silly doing that stuff, I rarely do it. Um, again, I'm way up on the bankroll. Um you know, I didn't. I, I've actually bet pretty close to my winnings. Um, I, I lied. I, I said I bet under, so it didn't matter if I lose. If I lost, it still would have sucked because I, I did bet close to my winnings from the prior card. But we still had a winning night, and I think I did. I, I'm really bad again. I don't want to play into the racism, reverse racism, or whatever that I've definitely been guilty of in the past. Um, talking stereotypes, you know, just because I'm just because I'm Asian doesn't mean it's okay to like you know. Fucking joke about Asian stereotypes, but many of the Asian stereotypes have been lauded on your boy. Um, math is not is is uh, is is you know again the stereotypes for a reason I guess, but math is uh, it's definitely your, not your boy's strong suit. Uh, you know, in many cases, as I, I used to say that I was a a bad Asian. Um, See, so yeah, I came up with two different calculations. I think it was like plus four six something that I I posted, and then. It didn't feel right, so I ran the tape again, and I think I got like plus like 4.88 units uh, for the profit, uh, uh, as far as the profit margin. And then I realized again with the Bautista now, like I didn't even add the fucking unit on Bautista, right? Uh, which is fine because I already posted it, and again it was only in one house, so uh, kind of iffy. And you know me, I'm always, I'm always <laughs> one of the few guys who rounds down. You know, uh, I'm secure with myself and my betting record. Uh, <laughs> um, it's no big deal, but yeah, I, I, I think we actually went up um, another five units, uh, uh, or close to, if you do the mean average or whatever, right, for the houses. Um, and then the good news, I guess, we'll see. I mean, in the sense of even if it all loses, it'll be good news. Going real conservative this week. Um not so much cutting the unit prices that I played down, but as far as plays in general, um, you know, we could have a, a pretty thrilling game of Russian roulette. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't fill up uh, all the uh, chambers, but enough to leave some holes. That can maybe a bad analogy, but not a lot of bets, which is which is probably good because it's a real dangerous week, man. Real dangerous week. And, um, yeah, so ending up going with the analysis, the reads, um, the more proven sample sizes, whether it be the matchup or just in general on the board, so on and so forth. But with a lot of these, you know, I feel like I keep writing impromptu or newly ma minted main events. It feels like uh, a lot of these fights, uh, you know, when we're, we're picking on these plays, I'm going to, you know, bust through this review here. Um <clears throat> We, uh, you know, we, uh, it, it's like the, uh, sorry, fucking, I bet I did like two all-nighters this week. Um, it's like the analogy, you know, if you're in a room full of fuck, you know, yeah, you know, I say I weeded out the best bets, but it's like, well, if you're in a room full of, you know, sixes, you know, a four looks like an eight, you know what I'm saying? If that, that math makes sense. Uh, so the same goes for these these bets. So you know on these these kind of cards, so you got to be careful. But yeah, uh, again nine and three overall, and I and I just listed off uh, the plays. We'll go through them now real quick. Um, <clears throat> it was a headline by Jamal. Bolt the door if you're coming in. You're the man now, dog. Uh, beat a Johnny Walker. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, sorry. Sean Connery was definitely happy from the grave. He had a little case of rigor mortis there when 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 Jamal um, got that knockout again. Man, I told you guys I wrote down the breakdown. Um, 
it was a right from Orthodox. You know, I thought it was going to be the right hook from uh, Southpaw. But a uh, little, little stance switch there, which, to my recollection, Jamal, um, he's shown that he could fight from Orthodox, but I don't remember anything meaningful like that, and that was nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, I, I like him a lot. I like the post that he did, you know, uh, about everybody, uh, meme and Walker. And I get it, man. And I don't want to get on a high horse because, you know, fucking all the jokes I make on this podcast, I'm a hypocrite. I'll admit it. I'm a hypocrite. But, uh, at the same time, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, Especially the MMA betting space, which uh, I always got to remind myself the age. <laughs> that although I don't look it, I, I definitely feel uh, you know, amongst amongst the older. And it's not a knock, by the way. Uh, love love a lot of y'all, uh, obviously. But <clears throat> I just got to remind myself that I'm getting older is what I'm trying to say, okay? And, uh, you know, so my, my humor is stupid and immature as it is. Again, I'm, I'm no better. I'm a fucking hypocrite. But, um... That being said, I, I I dare say in my defense that uh, you know I'm, a, I'm a, you know, most person says oh you know, catch that I hope that person's okay this and that um, or I'm pretty good like 99 percent of the time I'm always doing that um, you know when 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 you know not a lot of people are and again it's just a tweet it doesn't fucking matter empty you know T's and P's right like I said earlier uh, who the fuck are you Dan I, I get it I'm just saying for what it's worth um. But yeah, I, I appreciate that message because yeah, there's just a lot of just like, a lot of just just you know, shit talk, petty shit. I went realize like this stuff changes lives, you know, and this and that. And uh, again, it's okay to criticize, you know, uh, critique performance, preparation, training camps, things like that. That's fine. But uh, I'm not talking about that. But yeah, yeah, the meme stuff and whatnot that that Hill was was, was going on about. You know, hey man, good on him. You know, I don't think it makes you fans because you know it's all about dunking on people here. But um, you know, fucking Hill don't give a fuck, and I appreciate anybody who just doesn't give a fuck. You know, like that. So good on Hill. Uh, Big Dick Dawkins, Kyle Dawkins cashed the Dars, the Dars Knight uh, uh, defeats uh, Jamie Pickett. Um, it's funny. I think I was singing like searching for a night. Well, I can't even. I have no highs right now. Not that you know, I'm a fucking natural baritone, anyways. But because uh, his, his name is Night Wolf, and that song came in, came in my head. And I, it's like many songs, like uh, you, you sing in your head, you don't know the words. Like oh, there's a, hold the line, love isn't always on time. Like I didn't know it was hold the line. I just thought it was like oh, why. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think I didn't know it was fucking words. Like, and you just will go, you know, like, I thought Secret Agent Man was Secret Asian Man. You know what I'm saying? Secret Asian Man. Like, I, I didn't know these things, right? So, uh, you know, I just thought it was like Night Wolf was a song. But I was I was cruising in my car the other night. And it was, uh, and the sign came on. It was Night Moves. Night Moves. Woo! Right, anyways. Um... Pick it could have used some more night moves to get out of that, but the Darth Knight got him. Oh, you see, it came full circle there. Um, actually, his tongue almost getting bit through Jim Millison style, which we'll get to. Got him. Parker Porter defeated Alan Badeau. Um, yeah, it was ugly. I'm glad. Um, happy, you know, Porter uh, cash for those of you that, that, that bet him, by the way. I, I didn't mean any disrespect, but I just was glad that I didn't end up betting him because. A lot of the prop flyers I think I would have took wouldn't have cashed, and um, it, I didn't want to have that sweat. Um, Jim Miller's son defeated Nicholas uh, M Mota. Mata. Um, I, I think I got excited, and I said, this is exactly how I said it would come out. I thought it was more of a check hook, and then in, then in the replay, it was obviously the coming forward one, and I was like, oh, yeah, well, still. Um You know, the, I did cite the uh, Mota whether he's hooking or attacking in general. That uh, that side would be open to get uh, to get you know to get hooked, and that's what happened in that sense. And uh, yeah, I ended up jumping on the under as well. 
um, and that hit as well. So under Jim Miller inside the distance, and uh, Jim Miller money line plus one fifty five, uh, all cash. That made the night, baby. Um, that was good considering that the uh, parlay uh, fell apart, right? And that's why we do those things because I believe Dawkins was the first, uh, the the last leg, and and he obviously hit. And so did his bonus. So, again, that's why we layer these things. That's why we spread it out. That's why we're strategic. That's why we do things like, or try to at least with the bankroll management, right? Like this week I'm betting, you know, I, I'm betting, th I, I think I bet three total units this week uh, is what I was getting at. And then, again, you, you, let's not even say, let's say 4.5 or whatever, you know. Um, that's still 1.5 units left over. Um, so I mean, hopefully we're going to still do well. We're going to at least get back what we give at the very bare minimum. That's what we aim to do every week, you know. You know, a little profit is profit nonetheless. I'll be happy with that, right? But if we do take it on the chin because you're going to have plenty of weeks this year where we're going to take it on the chin, myself included, folks, you know. I know I'm hot lately, or especially if you've only just come on lately on the train lately. Uh, I, I hope you guys know that the sun does set, you know. It doesn't matter um, you know, unless the world is ending. But, uh Jeez, don't joke about that, you know. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't. I have no. I have no illusions. This is definitely not a confident week, so I'm not. I'm not laying a lot. Uh, Dan, get to the recap. Keep keep on the recap. Sorry. Uh, stop feathering your nest for 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 your inevitable fall. I know. I know. Uh, Joaquin Buckley defeated Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Um, this was an ad that missed. Uh, again, I don't think it was the. the you know, the worst bet or the worst analysis in the world. I did pick Al Hassan round two, uh, which is the round he clearly lost in. But I did say that he, he was going to win in a trend-breaking style. And he almost did, and you could argue that he should have if you looked at the uh, the fact that, you know, if you saw Buckley getting rocked and stammered, he, you know, he uh, Hassan landed the harder shots throughout the round and the hardest shot, right? Um, minus the shots that he landed in round three on Buckley, that is. Um, but, uh, again, it was close. Buckley, even though he didn't get a lot done with the takedowns, he was active with them and strikes, even though the strikes, in my opinion, weren't as effective. Um, but, again, I'm not, I wasn't crying about it then. I'm not going to cry about it now, of course. It was a winning night. I took my shot. Uh, I think it was only, like, what, like a three-quarter unit, if that, or something. So, I, again, wham. Uh, David Onama defeated Gabriel Benitez. Um, liked Onama, and he would have to have gone down and not up for me to bet him, but as soon as Benitez missed weight and looked bad on the scales again, everybody piled on the Onama train. Um, probably had to sweat for a little bit. My guy uh, Benitez, uh, you know, show why me and many with a technical eye respect him, but uh, Onama came through, and he's who I picked. So if you played him, congrats. Um, you know, uh Tough luck if you play Benitez, but, you know, he, he came out and fought for you despite the weight miss. But uh, I don't know how much more that guy's got left, and uh, obviously Onama's got a lot ahead of him. Um, and I obviously look forward to seeing more Onama. Uh, Stephanie Edger defeated Jessica Rose Clark. Grats if you bet Edger. In fact, I, I think you should have got more if you bet Edger because I don't think, you know, again, WMMA, something I warned myself of. And, again, this is why we do bankroll management. This is why... We spread out, and we layer the plays. We layer the legs, right? Uh, and we come out on top, and we still we still won, so it's all good. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, this was, a, this was a card where, you know, just like this card this week where you're going to have to take risks no matter what. And I said this on the podcast last week. I'm not trying to play revisionist history. I did say this where... Um, this is this is a week where you're going to, you know, you're going to have to kind of take risks. There's no sturdy legs, if you will, so... You know what you're getting into. I knew what I was getting into, so I can't cry about it now. Um, you know, it looked like a bad bet from a perspective of, you know, Rose Clark did the one thing she shouldn't have done and played into the strength and gave Edger the one way she was going to win. Again, a female in any weight class with, with a bad gas tank is a huge red flag. Um, so I don't. I, I still don't know why people are high on her, and, 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 and you know we'll have to get our money back on Edger. Hopefully, you know between the blonde hair, the armbar win, right, beating another kind of hyped, you know, uh, air quotes marketable girl. You know she's gonna get some kind of a push, and if you uh, lost some money, you want to make it back. Uh, you'll have plenty of chances on Edger, so don't worry. 
I mean, again, not hating on people that better. If anything, I'm happy for you. And and on more on that, I wish you got more because I think you should have got more. Again, Edger was not good. Even even you know, uh, people uh, picking her online. Um, what I did see or hear, I didn't hear really any technical analysis. It was like your typical betting stuff, like she's bigger, and you know how I enter Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Insert Dan Tom Jerkoff GIF here. Um, you know how I feel about reach stats, height, and you know, um, you know, picking fights off of size or age. You know, like basic ass stats that anybody can kind of see and read. It's not my thing, and that's not why people come here. So I, I would be doing me and you guys a disservice if I just stuck to that. So, um, but uh, it, you know, it was it was tough, you know, um, because Rose Clark she does play to the clinch. This was a thing, but. The thing was, she had options to win outside. We've seen her win striking matches against girls where their only shot, uh, speaking of blonde grapplers, Paige Van Zandt, where their only shot was to grapple. Um, we see them stay disciplined to a striking match. Oh, but Paige Van Zandt broke her arm. Well, she would have lost that match. Anyways, A and B, um, that might change the fact of Van Zandt's grappling intent in that fight, but that didn't really change the fact of Rose Clark's, um, who stayed disciplined for the most part on the feet. And when she did get on top... She did well because even in Rose Clark regional days where she was just all over the place um, in bad relationships, unstable camps, whatnot, she actually always had a decent top game, a strong top game. So if the fight did go there, um, assuming it was on her terms and she gets the takedown safely and not like what happened where she gets you know taken down and, and uh, armbar from top mounted, um, she would be okay again. It was the first time she'd ever been... You know, again, people saying, you know, as bad as Rose Clark was, she never been stopped ever. That was the first time she she'd been stopped. So again, another reason why I'm not hating. I think that if y'all bet Edger, y'all should have gotten more for that. But um, if 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 you know, um, a, a fighter fighting bad and getting rewarded for it, it bugs me. Or someone making a bad bet and then, you know, stamping on it in victory lap and uh, doubling down on it, if you will, annoys me, well then, it would be hypocritical for me to be like, well, it has it not going to annoy me if you make a bad bet and it loses, because we all see people make bad bets lose, and like, they try to double down on it and this and that, so no, you got to take your lessons from it, and I guess the lesson here is, you know, uh, WMMA, and, um, you know, uh, you just got to kind of... Um, Mark a you know mark a certain ceiling level for the matchups that you're you're gonna look to uh, you know if at all kind of get involved uh, with Clark I'm still a Clark uh, Jessica Rose Clark fan um, uh, obviously you know uh, you know uh, uh, interviewed her before and this and that for whatever that's worth I mean like I talked to her it's not like we're friends we can hang out or anything like, there's no bias there. Or, or in the pick, but uh, but yeah, you got to mark these things and note these things going forward. Where is Edger? Um, grats if you want, but I guess I would warn you being careful to, to ride this train. There, There's going to be a hard ceiling. And if you lost, you will have time to, uh, you'll have uh, time and lines, uh, and, and a decent line, I suspect, to make it back. Um, another good hit of the night, which helped, uh, was Chaz Skelly inside the distance, baby. Mark Striegel, again, I know these are submission guys, Miller and Skelly, two of my favorites, but um, between the matchups that they were in, two guys that could get hurt and them having underrated striking, um, you know, that's why I said inside the distance and not submission, submission, dun, 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 submission. So, you, you know, you can't uh, can't do that. Um, so that was a that was a that was a good bet. That was a good bet. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Gloria De Paula defeated Diana Bovita. Didn't watch this. No opinion. Chad Allenhanger defeated Jesse Schrader. Didn't really watch this. No opinion. Um, Jonathan Pierce versus Christian Rodriguez. Um, I didn't play this one, but uh, Jonathan Pierce. Um, this was a really interesting one because we have to learn. I tweeted this. We have to learn a lot about about uh, each fighter. Um, you know. Uh, Pierce, you know, he, and, and again, I don't, I don't know if this is a one-off thing because he's getting older and you know he's really big and cuts a lot of weight, even though he looks in great shape and, and you know, fight ready, I believe, and yeah, he had a good camp and this and that. You know, maybe there is something where he could potentially wrestle himself into a hole. 
if he fights an actual guy on a full camp, an actual guy for the weight class, etc. You know, Christian Rodriguez, definitely looking forward to seeing him down at Bantamweight, uh, his natural weight class, I think many people forgot. Um, you know, he was fighting there on short notice. Really like that in, in a loss, whereas, you know, I don't want to say outright flags, but some potential flags, I will say, with, uh, with Pierce. As much as there is to like, and there's a lot to like, not hating on the kid. I picked him here, glad he won. If he cashed a bet for you, awesome, good, happy for you. Just saying, you know, there were some things to, to note there. Again, we have to note these things, right? Whether we get the pick right, uh, whether we get it wrong, whether we get the bet right, whether we get it wrong. Um, I'm not saying these things out loud, like talking down to you. I'm mainly saying them out loud for me, if anything. To kind of instill them to my head, especially like, you know, the shit that I whiff on and and and, uh, and get you guys to whiff on, which was, uh, for this card, was the... Rose Clark leg, and then if you tell me on the Abdul Razak um, Al Hassan, um, so apologies for that. But again, everything else made up for it. I didn't expect anybody to tell me on Batista because I tweeted that right before the fight, and that was kind of just for me to kind of bolster one bank. Uh, but Mario Batista defeated Jay Perrin. Um, it was a good fight for Batista. Perrin hung tough, but it was a really good fight, you know, for showing some skills for Batista. So. Um, you know, uh, I hope you guys uh, uh, all did good. A lot of the betting people I follow and I'm friends with and shout seem to have had winning nights. That always makes me happy. We're not competing with each other. We're competing with the bookie. Um, I know I have my, my pet peeves with analysis and this and that. And uh, I, I tend to talk shit, not about the betting, but just about the MMA space in general because I'm just that fucking grumpy old man. The, uh, the, the Asian Bill Burr of the MMA uh, b b betting circle, if you will. But, um, you know, I'm just a fucking curmudgeon like that. But honestly, again, I, uh, you know, I try to call it as clean as I can. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to win for uh, all of us to win and happy for all of you to win. You know, again, we shouldn't be playing against each other. We're playing against the bookies here. Uh, so that was that card. And uh, we missed the bet. Oh, another bet we missed. My bad. But again, it was still a winning night, and this was uh, incorporated. We missed the Gracie bet. He was live, like I said, in late. But again, you know, maybe that's my fault for not, uh, you know, waiting to see what a uh, Logan Storley striking would look like. But he just felt like, and we'll talk about um, this in the co-main event with one of the fighters. Uh, some fighters just feel like they just can't not strike without, you know, going for takedowns. Um, and that's what I thought was going to be the case for Storley. But but uh, not only that, the guy could strike, he could counter, and counter with effect. So, you know, um, didn't lay anything crazy. And, and definitely not anything I'm not comfortable with losing. Still ended up being a winning night, so it was all good. But, uh, but yeah, that was a whiff there. But I'm a Storley fan, so I was, I was really stoked that I got to see um, the evolution that, frankly, was really needed there for him. So that was really good for him. Um, oh, bonus missed by one, of course. Uh, with the Clark by decision, that was my little uh, bonus. All the rest of the props hit. Um, again, 4-1 and one in props. It's crazy, folks. So if you guys round robin, by the way, you guys made out big. Um, shouts to my guy, Jerry H. He's one of one of, uh, one of of a few people who got back to me who, who cashed out big on those round robins. Because I, I gave you guys out two three-leg parlays for, like, one was plus... 15 the other was like plus 25 and if you round robin you would have uh you would have cashed nicely on both of those but because my houses that didn't and the only two um dual legs in both parlays was uh Dawkins inside which cashed but clark by decision which didn't um that ended up biting me big there and not really because i mean I, just like this week by the way I, I if your house involves a free play i tend to use the free plays for it because they're such stupid numbers right you don't need to lay much but that was that, as they say. Um, all right. Where are we at now? Wow, 34. All right. Breakdown time. 35, actually. UFC Vegas 49. UFC Fight Night 202. UFC Fight Night. Um, Mahachev versus Green. We'll go with this one from top to bottom. Um. Oh yeah. Uh, let's see. 
I don't know if I said it earlier, but uh, I played Musasi inside the distance plus 115 for one unit uh, opposite uh, Vanderford. Uh, two things, basically. Uh, I, I in-depth breakdown of MajorJunkie.com, but you guys, this fight might be over by the time you guys listen to it. Basically, regardless of how this bet went, this could be one of the last times to bet Musasi as far as, even though, um, you know... He didn't look uh, terrible enough for me to not pick and play him here, obviously. He is obviously, you know, aging out. Um, he's past prime. Or th that's obvious, but uh, as far... And he, but he, but he, he's not shot or anything. But, uh, you know, before he gets too close to there, right? Or a bad stylistic matchup. So that is one way to look at this, to justify playing Musasi at a playable line. And the second way to justify it, I guess, uh, all, as well, is even though Austin Vanderford, I, I, I didn't give him shit just for being Pages, you know, Mr. Van Sant. He was actually technically the first A-plus um, for my Dana White Contender Series columns because, you know, Dana was just on the rampage of only signing first-round finishers, and I'm like, I wanted to see someone come through adversity, and he did, and he didn't get signed, so I was like, I know, that, that means a lot. And, you know, that could come in big here, that ability to come through adversity. But like on Contender Series and a lot of his fights, he, he really hasn't taken big steps up. Um, and when he has, he's won to decision, which the kid looks like, Vanderford looks like he's got a good gas tank. So this, he's much more livelier and has a much more clear path to victory than John Salter, which, by the way, I had some really big Bellator bets last, week, last year, and that, this was one of them, if you remember. I, I had Musasi, Musasi TKO, Musasi round three. Uh, I think I played like three or four angles, whatever, and they all cash. I even screenshot it and sent to some of you. That was big, along with like, what did I get on like Vadim Nemkov versus uh, what's his fuck? Um, again, another dude who's just like, I think he had the same exact record as Vanderford, um, and he actually had better experience than Vanderford did. Uh, and Nemkov has less experience than Musasi. Uh, but uh, very similar matchups actually in parallels, and uh, and uh, and yeah, except for um, the other guy actually ha had a professional loss and is shown to be hurt and, and finishable. And then even though Nemkov was like something plus minus eight hundred or minus eleven hundred in the money line, they had him like they had him by sub by plus twenty one hundred or something stupid. Remember that? Uh, shout out to Lance Fischel. That was a good night. I cashed like all three tickets of the sports book, and uh, it was like Jim Miller fought that night too. Jim Miller under against uh, Eric Gonzalez, um, and uh, yeah, I also hit that Bellator was going on that night, and I hit that that sub at plus twenty one hundred. So there were some good things. I know we whiffed, we cashed Bader, which was nice the week before. Uh, last week we whiffed, um, so we'll see if we can hit this week. Um, but, uh, yeah, my second point, sorry, even though uh, I gave Vanderford A+, plus, I'm sorry, I'm disjointed, folks, more than usual. It's I, I'm really trying to get to a point where I'm not fucking, I'm early, and I'm actually rested when I record these. One day, one day, fucking hell. I didn't even work out those weeks. But basically that even though I'm, uh, I'm not trying to shit on Vanderford, I will say, you know, it's not the deepest divisions over in Bellator, and Bellator is not beyond... Uh, to push the gimmicks or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, big names, or even if you're not a big name, you, like, there's this thing that I've all long said, like, if you have a name that sound, uh, sounds like a famous person, they will sign you to fight, like Bobby Lee or, uh, like, Will Smith or, like, Dwayne Johnson, like, you know, all these people fight for Bellator. <laughs> and, you know, this could be one of those cases where you look back and, again, not to, not to write off, uh, uh, you know, Vanderford, who's now at a Florida American top team, you know, he could just King Mo it, who's King Mo is one of his coaches, by the way, to Musasi and just wrestle him for five rounds. Definite path here, folks. Definite path from reality. That being said, um, this is a huge step up. And um, in hindsight, you know, you get, you're getting plus money. One of the last, you know, one of the last times maybe you bet you could feel good about betting Musasi at plus money. Um, angle wise, you know, in a matchup that uh, he should win. I mean, it's a guy who's what is he, ten and one or whatever, ten and zero, or eleven and zero. Only eleven fights. Only been pro for. Is he eleven and zero? Vanderford. He's only been you know pro for twenty seventeen for five years. He fought amateur, but only you know, uh, four times or so, and that looks to be uh, 
only dating back to 2015, you know? Like, so, I mean, um, you know, so in hindsight, you know, this could really be, you know, this could be a, one of the many vet lessons that we've seen in the last year and a half, right, folks? And um, I haven't had the balls to bet some of them or I've been on the wrong side of some of them, but I feel like I've been on the right side more often than not. And I want to keep that here, especially for my guy, Musazito. It is long, so you fucking, I don't uh, know, fuck Bisbing, you know. He uh, likes to, to talk about my fucking flower shirt, but I uh, sit here and... Uh, remember that, that, that like, Bisbing latest or whatever. Or it's like Musasi latest. He just fucking was like, had that flower shirt and he was just talking shit. Ah, good old gay guard. Um, yeah, laid him here, fuck it. All right, uh... Da, 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 da. 41 UFC alright yeah UFC fight night uh, Green Mahachev alright um, Mahachev minus 900 Bobby Green plus 6 everybody asks me should I sprinkle Bobby Green should I sprinkle Bobby Green I want to put, put your money and like I don't know yet uh, I haven't looked into it yet and uh I'm not going to argue with anybody that wants to sprinkle, uh, again, sprinkle, which means small, which means, you know, even if it's not small, it should be something you don't mind parting with, way, ways with, is a volatile sport we're betting on here after all, but uh, yeah, go ahead, do what you want, I don't blame you, maybe I will for the fucks of it, so, you know, maybe I'll throw $17, because when I was 17, I had my very first beer. Um, no, I don't know. But, like, yeah, do 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 whatever you want. Um, I'm rooting for you guys, rooting for green, but I, I got to try to be, you can never be unbiased. You know, I'm subject to homer picks as much as the next person, although I, I, I feel like I do a good job stating those biases or whatever could be perceived as biases, right? Um, but, um, but, yeah, um... I, I, you know, it's hard not to pick Makhachev here. Ten days notice, and you know Bobby Green. Not just ten days notice. Like I know he's fresh off a three round domination, but he still went three rounds. You know, um, he's still feeling the last fight. According to Bobby, he blew up to one ninety five because he didn't even cut down to his last fight. Um, healthily, because he only took that one on short notice too. So that's what people are missing. It's two short notice fights back to back, and Bobby looked rough on the scales. I can I don't remember him ever looking rough on the scales, um, and his eye was all funky. Like I was really worried. It almost scared me off Bobby Green, but it must have put more people on hack press because it brought Bobby Green's line down to a, it was an awful I couldn't refuse. So um, you know I pulled the trigger and then we cashed on Bobby Green at a discounted price. But you know. I, I, I don't know if the context is discount. Or is, I don't know if discount is the proper context, I should say, here. Um, so it, it really wasn't about the pick for me. Um, this is a really hard fight to play. I would say over one and a half if you were to get in that early, but that got inflated all to hell. Um, I didn't listen to MMA analysis yet. That's one of my desserts. Um, I read uh, The New Yorker is my dinner. The tabloids are my dessert. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to blow up his, I don't know if he ended up playing it with it, playing it, but, you know, I was just chatting with my, with my man, with my man Brad, and, you know, we were talking about that over, and, you know, he brought up a nice accompaniment, which, you know, again, if you, if you don't want to play, you can, you know, if you look for a house maybe with, like, round one KO for some stupid number to hedge in case that breaks the, uh, um, in case that breaks it, your over bet, which you'd be laying uh, chalk on, right? And, again, I'm not picking green, and I get it. You know, the ally of Quinta was an anomaly. He's not really a, a knockout puncher like that. But, you know, all these Masvidal uh, comparisons, you know, this could be his Askren fight, right? And this could be one of those fights where it happens. Makachev is being just so damn disrespectful. Um, Makachev has been put out in the first round before by guys who aren't known to be strikers, like... Adriano Martinez, who was a southpaw, Bobby Green, 
mainly fights southpaws when he faces other southpaws. He loves to do that. Or fights southpaw when he fights grapplers, right? Um, even though Bobby Green, not much of a check hook guy, more of just like checking jabs and crosses, darts, rolls. Um, he'll hook off to the body, and it, you know he'll, he'll actually check out hooks. Like one of the things I posted with that Pat Healy fight, <laughs> it's great. Um, you know, like, this age of commentary does great with Bobby Green, but like the old era, like Goldie and like Rogan were just like, Goldie's like, his footwork is slowing down. Like in the clip I posted, and you see Bobby Green just fucking styling. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I, I think still think Bobby Green's more likely to get an earlier finish than Makachev. And that's the reason why I like the over, because even though I'm not picking Bobby Green, um, I really wanted to do him justice in the breakdown because he deserves it. He deserves his main event slot, even though he would have been nice because he uh, for him to get, you know, full camp, which he also deserves. But um, I really wanted to do him justice because I, I never officially did a profile Bobby Green. You just have me fucking waxing on to you guys on this damn podcast. So I really wanted to do an official one, and I think I did him some justice. You guys, let me know. Thank you for sharing. Please share. I know my man John Anik had some nice words here with my man Aaron Bronstetter. These things mean the world to me. Thank you guys. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that was the point to show. I went real deep into his defense and and wrist separate uh, his grip separations. Uh, that's what I mean by hand fighting. You know, there is a striking reference of hand fighting, sure, but I mean it more as far as grappling. It's the unsung hero um, in MMA and grappling and grappling for MMA especially, grabbing the hands, grabbing the wrists, separating the hands off takedowns. Makachev mainly for uh, wrist controls, gripping wrists, you know. You know, whether he's offensive, he's on the back, peeling Leo Kuntz's, uh, Kuntz's uh, wrists off the mat so he falls on his face. Or, you know, his typical defensive grip separations, more of the Max Holloway-esque style of uh, the high and tight wizard with uh, accompaniment of wrist control to separate the grips of the takedowns. Whereas Bobby Green is a more unique style. I don't know if there's a name for it. Um, but he uses this underhook arm drag variation in conjunction with an opposing kickout pressure, um, as I tweeted and inserted said tweet uh, at Dead Home MMA into my main event article, uh, in-depth article at MMAJunkie.com. Um, and it was crazy. I'm like, where have I seen this before? And then I went back to a picture that's dated back in 2013 or 2012 or 2013 um, of me and my grappling team, and I'm actually using this same defense. Uh to separate a grip and uh, shouts to rich castro for capturing it and i actually remember this exchange it was one of my last grappling practice before i went to new york and i was going against a guy named dom tim who um if you heard about me saying a back dick specialist around the gym who may have choked out pros you may know uh, like michael chandler uh he may or may not be that guy and 99.9 percent of all my matches with him and with me getting choked by him on my back because that's Dom's thing and he's the fucking man um, but in that photo you see me using the same defense as Bobby Green does where using the arm drag uh, underhook with my right arm as my right shoulder is facing him my left shoulder is facing the cage standing perpendicular is that the word? to him, his single leg attack and usually you want to swim your like outside foot position on an open stance striking matchup, there's kind of that same thing as far as single leg defense. When someone snatches up your leg, you want to immediately swim the leg snatched up onto the outside. And when you use this defense, you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. You can use your opposing kick out pressure, plus having a knee shield as a block, jujitsu, and having that foot to the outside position, wrestling, right? You're, you're killing multiple birds, birds with multiple stones um, with this method. And, of course, if you're near the cage, it makes it a little more easier to balance and counterbalance on your one leg at times, right? Um, and you'll see Bobby Green, like, when in the clip that I posted with Clay Guida, depending on what leg is, you know, Clay's trying to grab, he's kicking out to disrupt those grips, right? Green is. And um, Green will eventually, you know, with the Pat Healy stuff, he uses it to drag it to turn corner and strike, which was fucking beautiful. Uh, but back to the photo where I was doing it, and I remember that exchange and how useful and the good this technique is uh, to turn corners and spin people, is that there's no video of this. There's only photos. Um, but uh, 
and I, and I didn't want to go through it because it's not about me and who cares, I suck. But I actually have photos to prove that you'll see the next photos in the series. I'm taking Dom's back off of it. And I actually have him in the choke and it looks like I'm finishing and I don't. Time runs out. And uh, it was the closest I ever came to, to finishing him. But I actually got his back off of it. Um, and it's something I've done off singles before. Um, as I like, it depend, you know, depending on their head position, you can kind of, it's like similar uh, mechanics of hitting a switch, except you're using an arm drag mechanic instead of sticking your leg and hooking into the thigh and hip crook. And uh, after you break the grip, you still have an arm drag connection there behind the tricep. And the great thing about using that kick out pressure and that arm drag to separate the grip of mainly single legs this is used for the scenario is that kind of like the push pull judo right that human nature what's the human instinct there when when you when someone wants something and you deny it right somebody wants something they push one way you deny it you push them back the other what's their natural reaction push back harder right psychologically too if you're raising a kid out there right they're going to push back harder right if you if you if you if you if you, if you try to stop what they want to do right they're going to push back harder and the same thing goes for wrestling grips why wouldn't it right single leg snatch or you know, single leg grip you separate that grip they were already trying hard to keep it and they were already trying hard to go for it in the first place of course they're going to try hard to reassert that grip and as you feel them reassert to try to overly recorrect you all of a sudden open the gate and change course right and you let them run kind of like matador them right and you it sounds counterproductive. You're helping them go the direction they want. Um, but what it does is it makes them overcorrect what they want because they weren't expecting you to help them. And in that process, you pass their arm, as the arm drag is designed to do, and you your hip inserts and turns the corner on the outer skirt of their hook, crook, and, crook and corner. And next thing you know, you're toward their back or on their back if you so choose. Um, or you're, you know, you're, you're young and flexible as I once was, kids. Um, so I just, I don't know. It was one of my favorite transitions that's burnt into my head from almost a decade ago now. And to have gained an appreciation for this Bobby Green character and gain a job where I break down this stuff, um, at a high level and to kind of like go full circle and realize like, oh no, again, back to biases, folks. This is, this is why we need to stay. We, our biases are at work more than we realize. Case in point here, right? It happened to me. It always happens to me. It happens to me a lot. It happens to all of us. We got to admit that. Um, but yeah, it's like, yeah, no wonder why I love Bobby Green style. <laughs> you know, and you know, it, you, know I, you know, I say the commentators are biased to styles that they like. It goes for me too, folks. I'm an analyst too. I'm a martial artist too. I have my tastes. As you can tell, I'm very passionate to the point of, you know, pissing people off. And it sounds like I'm talking shit and throwing shade. I'm not. I'm just, I'm just very passionate. So please don't take it that way. I just, you know. Very passionate. Um, anyways. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to take Magachev. I think I officially picked him by decision with the obvious caveat that he could get late finishes and later rounds, uh, depending on what kind of shape Bobby Green's in. But I think he's good enough to survive. I talked way longer about that fight than I needed to. But I love Bobby Green, and he deserves it. And this card kind of sucks because, case in point, co-main event, Misha Serkinov, minus 120, Wellington Terman, plus 100. Again, this is another fight. Can Terman show to fight like Storley did without, you know, going to the ground, right? And that's kind of the ultimate test here. Um, except Serkinov, unlike Gracie, even though he is a multidimensional threat, um, the bigger finishing threat on paper, both in one category and arguably both categories from striking to submissions, right? Serkinov, check, check. Um, he's also the older guy, so we kind of know what we're going to get from him. If anything, we're going to see a bit of a less game, which I'd argue going back to watch, we see. I know, I don't know if, if there was injury or there's all, there's always injuries, right? Or what it was. I know there's a lot of big contract negotiations for that kind of, there was like a year or so, a year or two layoff with Serkinov. And then I know he had that. You know, the problems with his with his wife and cancer, which apparently is she beat. They're starting a family. They're out here in Vegas. Awesome. Misha, by the way, one of the nicest dudes. Just, you know, he looks like a big, mean guy. But I, th I think, like, you know, I, 
I, I don't know him personally, just from just know people that know him, interviewed him multiple times, yada yada, and just again seems like a salt of the earth guy. I was rooted for him. Felt bad when he was getting knocked out by Walker and those dudes because his wife was going through the cancer stuff. You know, he was jumping camps, um, which he is still in the process, and that's kind of what worries me here because now he's not with Extreme Couture, but still in Vegas, kind of training like nomadically. And uh, anyways, when he does come back, not only does he, you know, we see him with the knockout losses and whatnot, but, like, something seems different, you know? He doesn't seem, um, you know, you could maybe blame the knockout losses for losing the confidence in the striking, but even in the grappling department, doesn't seem ferocious, you know? Um, if anything, he has to kind of come back, which is good, and you should give him credit for, you know, what he did to Jimmy Crute. But, as we're seeing, Jimmy Crook can be wild and just give things away and, and self-destruct, uh, whether he means to or not. Obviously, he doesn't mean to, even though, by the way, doesn't Jimmy Crook look like uh, Matt Damon in The Last Duel? Anyone? Anyone? Um, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I still love Jimmy Crook. Don't worry, Mark Fellows. Don't worry. Still got love for Australia. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, he, he needed to get really fucked up first, and he's shown that he can be taken down, too. Um, he can sweep. You know, he, he was able to sweep, you know, Brown Belt at the time, who is now a black belt, I believe, Jimmy Crute. Long to Terman also entered the UFC young and as a Brown Belt, but now as a black belt. But Terman, like Storley, again, young, and, un, uh, you know, unlike Serkinoff, again, young, if someone's going to make improvements here, going to show a new fold of their game, um, it's going to be Terman, more than likely, especially in a fight that stylistically calls for it, right? Especially since who was Terman preparing for this? Adolfo Vieira. So again, whether he thought, whether he was just going to try to strike the whole time, or he is still going to grapple, but do it in a more strategic sense, because like with the Terman and even Serkinov, um, if he's confident in his wrestling and takedown style, which there is reasons to be, not only is he training with Glover Teixeira, um, it makes sense that he trains with Glover Teixeira, because his game is similar. He likes more of the, you know, uh, outside reap, outside trip, slash Polish throw uh, variations. Uh, but his second and arguably tied for, for uh, right up there with that takedown for first for Terman is single leg snatch variations, which is Glover Teixeira's specialty. So he goes and trains with Teixeira. Teixeira also beat Serkinov. And, again, Serkinov, he's got uh, Peruvian neckties, um, good sweeps. This, uh, you know, uh, deceptively flexible from the guard. All, all those things can be nullified, those threats from front chokes, guard, sweeps, if you take someone down in a half guard or better get side control, which is where you usually end up um, off of the takedown styles that Terman likes to do, whether, especially the body lock takedowns, but even to a certain extent, uh, the way he encourages scrambles off of uh, his single leg snatches, he can actually get more backs off of that, which will lead, obviously, to a half guard when someone turns into you. Um, he could go that route, too. You just got to hope that he doesn't get sweeped in the first round. Um, not that Serkinov doesn't have the cardio to sweep in rounds two or three. I don't know if he has the confidence to. And maybe he doesn't have the cardio because even though he's having to do road work and bike work to get down um, to 185, like... Again, I told you he looked different, like from 2019 to 2020 or whatever, that kind of like whatever that gap was in his career. Well, when he goes down to middleweight, he looks even more different and even more deteriorated. And I know that was his first cut, and I imagine he'll feel and look better this time. But I still got to imagine most of his camp was made for uh, cutting weight, whereas Terman, even though you could argue the size thing again, um, I'm not trying to be a hater if that uh, if that's how you break down you know the advantages here because you know what it could play out that way you know what I'm saying so I'm not hating at all but yeah Terman is a former welterweight but I, I will say the positive from that is that he's not cutting weight he's at his natural weight class um, now even though he's still not a big middleweight you know he's young he's growing into the division and uh, he's got a gas tank and output and uh, Serkinov's not confident and he's looking choppy and sluggish. Uh, I didn't like his takedowns, the way he was bending at the back, and the way he was, you know, moving. Um, you know, and it was still a close fight, but it just, I just, uh, man, I just did not like what I saw. And I like Serkinov. I did not like what I saw from the last fight. So I'm actually going to pick Terman here. I'm not going to play him. Part of the reason is because even though he's listed at plus 100, um, I can't find a plus number anywhere in any of the houses I'm at. 
and, and two, you know, I was like, do I really want to play this fight? I mean, this is a fight where I think I'll officially pick Terman by decision, but um, both of these guys could knock the other guy out, surpri- surprisingly. And more specifically, not just like with a punch, mind you, like I actually think the head kick for both guys are live. Terman's got a decent one that he doesn't throw a lot. And I'm like, boy, if he threw this, this could go well. And I'm like, oh, wow, this could be a good matchup to throw it against against Serkinov. And then Terman, sure enough, on his pads, working a lot of high kicks. Uh, Serkinov, the fact that the flexibility and hard kicks, Terman, um, even though he is 3-1 and one against the UFC level southpaws, you could argue that he's 4-0. and oh. uh, Again, loses a split on short notice on his debut to Carl Rovers in a fight where, he, again, you could, you could really... He fairly easily argue he won. So you could you argue that he's 4-0 and against UFC Southpaw. That's part of the reason why I'm picking Terman here. But even in those fights, he got you know hit with some left-sided power shots, which is what Serkinov does like to throw, but just his confidence and technique does not look the same. So if he wins, I'll be happy for Serkinov. Um, if you bet him, I'll be happy for you. Uh, but if you're betting Terman, well, maybe you'll be happy to know that I'm, I'm on your side as far as a pick goes for whatever that's worth. May the best man win. I'm picking Terman here um, by decision with possibility for a head kick KO on both sides in the open stance. Next fight, uh, G. Yon Kim, minus 160. Sorry, my vision's gone. You can tell that I'm, I'm, I'm in the wee hours of sleep here. Priscilla Cachoeira, plus 140. Um, I like Kim. She's still at Syndicate. Uh, but I will say, Cachoeira, she has been looking better. And I don't know if this is a recent change or the reason why she was doing better. But she went over to Figueredo's camp, Team Figueredo now. Um, looks in great shape, the shape of her life coming into this fight. And then after really re-watching some of ji on Kim's fights, um, or uh, Kim ji um I just... She just gets too hit hit too much, you know. She likes to counter. She doesn't have the volume. She can pressure at her best, but if a fighter decides to pressure, which is definitely going to be Cachoeira, like against everybody, right? Um, she will take the back foot, and that will be against the cage. She doesn't really shoot for takedowns. I think she shot for like four total across three fights. She's hit none. Um, whereas Cachoeira, even though her takedown defense is awful, um, she's actually looked better recently. Um, she's made measurable improvements. Uh, even in her recent fight, which was a loss, there were there were some defenses and improvements there. I don't like it, uh, which is why this is another dog that I'm not playing and didn't make my betting sheet because I'm not playing it. But I'm actually going to pick Cachoeira here, which surprises me to say. And you're essentially picking her to win by knockout because I don't. It's going to be gritty and gross if it's a decision. And Kim's never been stopped before, so again, there's all these weird things. But Kim. Even though she's never been stopped, and, and, you know, not to stereotype, but yes, you know, man, Koreans are just tough people. They've been through a lot of shit, so it makes sense. You know, I don't know if that, that gets embedded into the genetics, but that'll, that'll be my bro science for the day there. I don't want to get in too much trouble with that, but I'm just trying to say something nice is what is all. Um, she's very tough, but uh, also, if you go look, she's also been hurt in a lot of her fights. And, you know, these are human beings, folks. They're not invincible, um, so... I'll take Cachoeira as a pick, but I, I didn't play it if that tells you anything. Uh, next fight, Hobo Cop. Hobo Cop, baby. Bolsonaro's personal guards streeping the suites of Sao Paulo uh, from the filthy homeless. Uh, wink, wink. No, no, I'm just joking, obviously, not making fun of the unhoused. Um, just making fun of this guy for being looking like a Bolsonaro dude. And, uh, you know, as a, you know, shouts to uh, people on Twitter, what was it? At E1 uh, Ross and something Ke- Keeley uh, was just like uh, was just like uh, you know he goes from hobo cop goes from town to town racially profiling people in trouble. <laughs> uh, speaking of dudes, hobo cop looks like he's packing heat. You know he's, he's packing a big piece. I'm curious what the MMA analysis guys rank him in the hog rankings. Jesus, Dan. Sorry, it's it's late. It's early. He's fighting Armin Petrosian at plus one thirty-five. Um, money's coming in on Petrosian. I get get why he's contender series, sexy striker. We get it. Training at American Top Team. You know, threw himself as in his words at the jungles of Dagestan, whatever that means. But um. Whatever guys he was training with there, he followed them to American Top Team. I don't know how long, because, like, 
you know, just a few weeks ago, he was still back over in Russia. Um, and only one week ago, one picture was the American top team. So maybe it was one of those stop off points as he acclimates and travels into the States. So I don't know how much stock to put on that. Um, but the guy's got urgent get ups and he can come back and win fights. Um, dangerous, sporadic guy, fairly athletic for, you know, his divisions, which aren't they all the most athletic divisions granted. Um, but so is a uh, hobo cop. Um, I think the line was right at minus 200. I wouldn't want to see it get wider than that, but the fact that it's come down a whole quarter, a quarter of the price, 50 cents, um, you could justify a stab, if you can, especially if you can find like minus 150, which is my playable chalk cutoff on Rodriguez. Um, he could lose by knockout, but he should win at a slightly higher probability than what I feel he's listed now. That being said, even though you could technically justify that, I really don't feel like ultimately laying chalk in a fight that's violent and potentially volatile like this. Because, again, Rodriguez could very well get knocked out. And I know that um, before I placed money on this fight, and I accepted that. And you should too, especially if you're betting any kind of angle on Rodriguez. So you look at the under, but the under is like just as much, if not more, or maybe a little cheaper, but still you're laying chalk there, right? Maybe arguably playable chalk. Minus 140 range, 130 range, but still chalk. And you can get a crazy fight like Rodriguez and Iron Turtle and still get burned on the under because the under, you know, missed on that one, right? So it's not even like a guarantee. And Petrosian, because he has to, like, guys are all trying to grapple him, you know, he will, like, have to come back, um, which would be the smart move by Rodriguez. But Rodriguez, in his defense, actually has decent striking defense. Um, his chin worries me because he shows he can be rocked, but he actually has like really, you know, good de- uh, defensive tactics. Uh, I don't want to say sensibilities because even though he does the moves, sometimes he does them too long. Like he didn't get put out like he did with Jordan Williams against John Young Parker. Uh, but there was moments where I'm just like he swung back a couple more times than I would have recommended before he ended up clenching. He did the smart thing and clenched. But he didn't do it right away. And that could be more than enough to get him knocked out here in or off the brakes. The thing is, um, as much as Rodriguez can kind of get in and hook, doesn't mind hooking with people, he may be more dangerous there because that's his thing. That's actually his strong suit. Whereas Petrosian, even though he's the Muay Thai kickboxer, like, folks, he's not like, born and bred in the jungles of Dagestan training since he was a fucking sperm. Like, no, like, he, he started martial art he didn't do any martial arts until he was 20 fucking years old he didn't go pro until he was 28 um he did muay thai for what that's worth a really good martial art from 20 to 28 but he wasn't like you know like born and bred in this stuff and from boxing range he's been knocked out too he went and traded hooks with like a 2-0 and guy or something from iran and just got like ktfo'd um, Hobo Cop could definitely do that. Uh, so even though the sub is was juicy at the opener, plus 500, not so much at plus 4, plus 3, uh, to me at least. Uh, not, not that I'm, I'm, I'm hating on the stab. I'm just saying like he could knock someone out too. So instead of kicking for coverage and playing for chalk, and I, you're sweating no matter what if you play this fight. But I like Hobo Cop. He's shown that he can fight through the damages. He can get takedowns whether they're judo style from the clinch or powerful level changing doubles in the open, which is really good. He's going to be in the small cage. Um, Black belt world champion can knock the guy out. Um, Yeah, I don't know if this one goes to the decision just because of the urgency uh, between the offense and the volatility of Hobo Cop to the urgency and offense of Petrosian. Um... But yeah, I'm going to go uh, Hobo Cop inside the distance, plus 120, three quarter units. Um, that is that is the play. Um, all right. Next fight, uh, Armin Sarukian, I think. It's kind of out of order because of uh, fucking, what you would call it? Uh Best fight odds just throws it all over the place. Armin, so you can minus 220. You all Alvarez plus 180. Um, I'm taking Sar- Saruki in here. It's tough. I, I think he's going to wrestle him either to do a decision or I think he can knock him out off the lead side. 
obviously he's not the longest lightweight like Ismagulov was, which provided size parity, and he was able to use his lead hand to keep him off. Um, Sarukian doesn't really have that style. He re- he really connects to the wrestling, for one, but he does like a lot of uh, Eastern European and Russian style kickboxers for whatever reason. They're really good with off the lead side kicks and punches, and Sarukian punctuates off the lead side. Which is going to serve him really well and could possibly knock out Alvarez with the left with a left hook, kind of like he did in the last fight to Yagos, um, or a left high kick, uh, like he did in his fight uh, prior to coming to the UFC. Uh, Tarukin. Um, that being said, I'd be lying if I didn't say you know it does worry me that you know he's he's shown to be hittable with those right hands. If guys really just want to come at him and spam him and and get aggressive and, and launch right hands, they can't hit him and. That is one of the few th- you know things you all Alvarez will do. I know he's, he's he wants more respect for his striking, but um, and I know I'm not the only person that feels this way. But uh, you know I'm gonna call myself with my bias. But not only is he an opportunist, Alvarez, but he's also a size bully, and for that reason, I, not only do I have a hard time picking him, I he seems like a nice enough guy. So I, it's nothing personal, like no maliciousness. But I want him to lose because he needs to go to welterweight. He is a welterweight. You know, he's missed weight twice. You know, he's 6'2", 6'3", and he's thick. Like, how big do you have to be? Like, I don't say this often, folks. It's really bad to say this about a UFC fighter. Ignorant, look at me, I'm a schlub, this and that. All true. Okay, fine. Still, you if you need to si- if you need that much of a size advantage where you're still going to be one of the biggest welterweights, but you got to go to lightweight, that, that's, that's a sign of mental weakness for me. That's a red flag. Um... And he's looking bigger every time. He looks huge in this picture that's only like three weeks ago. And I was reading the Spanish and someone's like, pesos, like asking his weight. And he's like, huh, just a few pounds, like joking about it. Like, even if he makes weight today. Um, and if he doesn't, it's going to look really fucking bad. It's like, dude, you're fucking making jokes on your Instagram about making weight and like taking pictures where you don't you don't look like you're going to hit weight and you're making jokes about it. It's going to be real interesting what happens in a couple hours here. Um Maybe nothing. You guys are listening to after, so maybe this is all for naught. But, uh, yeah, dude, it, it, being a size bully like that, it's an advantage to all of a sudden it's not. And I feel like that could be this fight because if you look at it outside of the fight with um, Tiago Moises, he's pretty much losing all of his fights until he wins. And granted, outside of the fight with Moises, all those were fights where the, the, the fighter took him down and he wanted off of his back or created a... Low percentage, granted, but fight-ending sweep in the um, Daniel Bellowardo guy who never won any UFC fights case, right? So it was really tough to thing. whereas, like, you know, Sarukin was on the ground with Davi Hamosh. Um, he grappled for three rounds with Islam Makhachev. Um, I, I think he'll be fine and be able to stay out of the guillotines, the front chokes, and triangles. Uh, Sar- Sarukin also brought in this guy, uh, I forget his name, like Seglatov or something, He's nine and three, but like, I think all those losses are by decision slash split decision, like early in his career, and he's on like, or he's like, and he's on like a eight fight or some like big winning streak, like, and they're all mainly finishes by like triangles and guillotines and submissions, and he looks huge. He's only listed as like five eleven or six foot, so he's only a couple inches shorter than uh, Alvarez, but he looks huge, like the size of Alvarez. So that's good to see, you know, um, Sarukian, who's trained at Tiger Muay Thai and American Top Team in his past few camps. Um, you know, he's getting hooked up with good training partners and people looking after him, as, you know, they tend to do that with their athletes there. If it's Gucci Dictator, well, you know, I never know. Uh, I don't know. But uh, anyways, um, so, yeah, I'm going to take Sarukian here. As much as I wanted to play him, at the same time, i got to call my biases out. You know what? This could be a, a trap fight for him, too. This could be a fight where, you know, he, he, he gets caught by something silly. You know, prospect lost by submission, so to speak. Or uh, even by knockout or going into a knee, you know. It's it's 5'7", you know, versus 6'2", six, 6'3"-ish six, in there, you know. The reach in advantage is only going to be 3 or 4 inches for Alvarez. But, you know, again, the the size is sizable. And, you know, I, I, again, I hate to be... Harping on that, you know me, I'm that's not uh, that's not a main point of analysis, you know, but at the same time, I, for for me at least, but I just I can't ignore it. So again, I'm not hating on you and 
on anybody, who, like I said before, I'm not hating on anybody who uses those things to break things down because, you know what, it, it, it's a potential factor here. I'm, I'm acknowledging it too, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, yeah, uh, okay, next fight uh, we got. I'm sorry, right in. Um, Ignacio Bahamundes minus 195. Zhu Rong plus 165. I took Bahamundes and stayed away. Um, probably outstrike him. Either maybe a late finish or a decision, but then maybe Zhu Rong has made big jumps. I don't know. It's so hard to tell with a lot of these people from the Chinese regional scene. So I stayed away, motherfucker. Just one of those days. I didn't stay away from the next fight. She says, uh, I don't know so where that was going. Uh, Josiane Nunez, minus 210. Uh, Romana Pasquale, plus 175. Um, I took Nunez here. Um, basically, Pasquale's taking this fight on short notice. She is not not that experienced, not that experienced outside of the first round or second round, much less. Uh, those seem to be harder for her. She's mainly first round, do or die, and taking the fight on short notice. And I don't know if she's fought at 135 before, but that's going to be her new home. She's fought at like 150 and 145 mainly prior. So she's going to be cutting weight, short notice, already do or die. Uh, Nunez, most of her finishes are in the second round more than the first. Um, both like Muay Thai, but one's going to be more, more powerful, goes to the body in Nunez, kind of like a little John Lineker uh, or Jessica Andrade. Um, that'll take you pretty far in these divisions, especially at this level of these divisions. So... Um, I feel like she should be a safe parlay piece just on those basic things. So she's one leg of a plus money parlay. And uh, I actually put a quarter unit um, on Nunez round two. I've been doing pretty good with the round two props and the props in general. As I say that, I'll probably like biff on all of them. But again, folks, hopefully you can make some money. You, if you were able to round robin, I think you could have literally cashed three, if not four parlay, uh, prop parlays that I gave out in just the last three weeks. Um because my pops have been hitting pretty crazily. So as I jinx this prop, uh, yeah, that's what I played. A quarter unit on Nunez, round two, plus 450. Um, next fight, Terrence McKinney, minus 105. Uh, pretty much a pick him here. Uh, for uh, uh, Faraz ZM, minus 115. Um, took McKinney here, but you know I don't feel like playing chalk for the over. Not getting plus money on my side or either side. Feels like it could be a volatile fight. Uh, ZM's been pretty underwhelming, but that being said, that with his age and that that being said, he should be overdue for a jump here. But then again, you could say the same thing about McKinney, where he's at in his career. So this feels like a really volatile fight and an already volatile card, so I stayed away. Um, next fight I didn't. Uh, Pedro Martinez. I voted for Pedro. Minus two. Jonathan Martinez, minus 255. Alejandro Perez, plus 205. Um, yeah, despite these guys opposing luck with the judges, you know, Martinez having one of the more worst scorecards that come to mind um, that I referenced on that episode with uh, Scott Fontana. Uh, Shouts to Scott and Dan Urban, the couchside judges. Martinez Uhl, he gets robbed, whereas Perez, you know, he gets nods from the judges that maybe you shouldn't get. Um, that Andre Sukumta, Sukumta uh, fight, you know. Fucking guy gets knocked down like four times. It's like running in fear. And it like get, gets rounds, like the fuck. Um, anyways, so yeah, I have a little bit of. There's a little bit of that too with Perez. You know, I've uh, I've lost some money on this guy back in the day. But hey, man, I like Martinez, and I've lost some money on him too. You know what I'm saying? So that bias could work both ways. I mean, how many times do we see that bias play in this field where someone loses a bet? I'm sure we've all been guilty of it, right? Let's be honest here. And when then that person comes around, man, fuck these kids. <laughs> Right? You know what I'm saying? So that bias works both ways. But I'm stating it again. Got to call myself out here too. Um, But, man, I don't know, Perez, to, to quote to K Teddy KGB, he's like, he's in the uh, John McDessie club of, you know, he's just hanging around, hanging, hanging around. Um, And, yeah, I think uh, Martinez, you know, he's, he could still be countered in boxing range. And, um... Perez can send some counters there, but I don't think he's going to be able to hit his leg kicks and takedowns uh, as part of his stymieing package that he likes to offer. Um, Turbo Perez is so weird. He's always that weird. I don't know, man. Something's off about that guy. And, like, off in a, you know, and, like, you know, 
the education system I was classified in technically in school with my direct office. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I, I sit at the same table, so I'm not shitting on the guy, I'm just saying. That boy, that boy ain't right. <laughs> just saying, saying a Hank Hill voice, but uh, hey man, who is in this game, right? Jesus fucking Christ, ain't that the truth? Uh, Perez seems like a nice guy, hard worker. Works at AKA. Um, he's got some good grappling in his back pocket, to be honest, but again, dude, we just saw Martinez, I, 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 I told you all, before he fought Frankie Sines, the re American wrestler, like... Martinez has improved there, and he showed it there. And you know, granted, maybe that bias was playing in, and it was crazy, and he was a lot of last-minute toss-ups, and I got in my own head, um, and I should have played Martinez when the line got flipped uh, against the Georgian, and not let everybody's you know, you know, analysis of Georgians equal win, smash the line, smash the line, or whatever, right? You know, um, you know, uh, but he showed that he can, he can, he can hold up to that style too. So I don't think Perez is going to be able to get any uh, cheeky tag tans, eh? Um, so I like Martinez. I think he wins by decision, but again, I don't want to tempt fate, uh, especially tempt fate against guys who have two opponents. I'm already tempting fate in enough, considering these guys' history with the judges, right? And, and where I'm where I'm backing and heading with this, I don't need any more exposure on, on, on some measly plus 135, plus 140 Martinez decision prop. So I didn't layer that leg like I did with the round two for Nunes. But if you pair up Martinez and Nunes, um, unless they continue to get bet up, it's not going to be plus money. But different combinations, different one ounces, you should be able to, get, to, to squeeze out some plus money. Uh, plus 102 was the lowest I got for a parlay. Plus 106 was the highest. Um, but, again, there's not much I like. So that's what, so that's what it is. The two leg. Um... Inside the distance, I'll, I'll recap these. We're almost done here because uh, I don't got much to say about Rami, Ramiz Brahimai, minus 380. Michael Gilmore, plus 290. I think Gilmore is stepping in on short Is he? I don't know. But I don't even know. If, either he's stepping in on short notice or this fight was put together short notice because Brahimai, we just saw him go. Hey, speaking of, again, you know, these, these fighters getting rushed to market, you know, they, they might have a nice record, but it's still around the 10-0 and mark or 10-1 and mark or whatever, right? They go against an older fighter that's going to sun them. That was a nice cash with Court McGee. And again, I, uh, I love being on the right side of those lessons because it's a very rewarding and it feels just when it happens in MMA. And usually you're getting nice numbers because the betting market likes the young, strapping, sexy strikers. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck Gilmore is. I didn't study this fight. I don't care. Um, next fight. Uh... Carlos Hernandez, minus 145. Victor Altamirano, plus 125. I'll take Hernandez as a favorite. Um, I don't remember much of these guys. I think they were both contender series people, but Dunbar's number. I wrote it up but don't remember. And it's probably going to be a tight fight like the line suggests, so don't want to expose it on low, lower level debutantes, lower on the card, no offense. How do we do on time? Oh, 123, fucking. Why did I say it was going to be expedited? Of course, it never is. All right, uh, recapping. The only thing I'm taking in Bellator is I'm taking Musazi. Fuck, I don't uh, the fuck. Uh, taking uh, Mahachev over Green. Taking Terman over Sirkinov. Taking Cachoeira over Kim. Taking Hobocop Rodriguez over Petrosian. Taking Sarukin over Alvarez. Taking Bahamundes over Zong. Taking Nunez over Pasqual. Taking McKinney over Ziem, taking Martinez over Perez, taking Brahimai over Gilmore, taking Hernandez over Altamirano, played Musasi inside the distance, plus 120, three-quarter units, play, or plus, one four, or plus 115, one unit, I should say, played Hobocop inside the distance, plus 120, three-quarter units, played Nunez round two, plus 450 at a quarter unit. Um, the house I can parlay props at, and, uh, did not uh, offer the Musasi inside the distance, so I, I did Nunez round two plus 450. Hobocop inside the distance at plus 100 there, and Martinez by decision plus 140 for plus 2,540, two so plus 2,540. And uh, I only put $4 in free play, uh, $4.50 in free play on that, and that returns like 100 bucks or something and change. Over 100 if that hits. Um, and Parlay, Nunez, and Martinez for plus 106 at one 
Unit. All right, that's all I played. Um, sorry for going long. It's a crazy week. Sorry, I'm all disjointed. I'm really. Uh, let's let's hope for everybody. All right, not just my fucking. Obviously, my privileged fucking first world ass here. Um, let's hope things settle down for everybody. Yeah, how about that? Let's go with that. Uh, let's hope things settle down for everybody. Um, let's just maybe listen more and talk less. Let's be there more and be assholes less. Um, be good to one another. You know, uh, remember the important stuff. Uh, good luck on your picks and plays. And always protect your neck. <laughs>